First, a warm welcome to all the club's members who are present this evening. Uh, we've had really heavy interest in Professor Schiller's appearance in this networking event, and we're so glad you can be part of the evening. I'd also like to give thanks to the club's staff, particularly activities manager Julia Chen, uh, for all their help in arranging the event. Our appreciation also goes out to Charlotte, Christina, Will, and the club's activities committee for helping all this to happen. Second, we are really pleased tonight to have students from Professor Schiller's course, Financial Markets, which is offered on Coursera, the online platform. I have personally been a very enthusiastic student of uh, Professor Schiller's podcast in the past, and I would highly recommend um, that you look up this course on Coursera. I think there'll be a new course starting potentially um, uh, sometime in the fall, so keep an eye open uh, for that. And finally, very exciting tonight, this is the premier event of Yale Fin. Yale Fin's an alumni network for finance, banking, and market professionals across different industry segments in various localities. There are successful career groups, you know, for tech, science, engineering, journalism, Hollywood, just to name a few. But up to now, kind of crazy enough, there's never been one for finance. The Alumni Association estimates that there are more than 5,000 alumni in finance in the New York area alone, and multiples of that worldwide. So it's a bit of a puzzle why no finance group exists. Um, maybe uh, Professor Schiller or some of you might have a clever economic explanation uh, for that. Um, but in any case, we think there's huge potential value uh, to a career network in finance. Now certainly the Yale Club has always served this purpose. It's a valuable meeting place and nexus for the finance profession. Um, and if you're not a member, you might think about joining. And if you're interested, uh, we have some members of our staff in the back who could actually show you around the club uh, this evening if you'd like. Uh, but to establish a network, a group of us set out early last year to start Yale Fin. And much of that group is volunteering their help here tonight. And after Professor Schiller's remarks, one of our co-founders, Will Shikani, will tell you a little bit more about the group um, and offer you some ways to keep in touch with our events and to get more involved. Uh, but in a nutshell, Yale Fin's purpose is to harness the incredible base of Yaleys in finance, to connect you with your peers across the profession, to host interesting events like this one, uh, for your development uh, personally and for networking and to engage you with students in the college and also in the school of management and in addition to larger events of general interest uh, we hope to spur some smaller gatherings uh, in particular industry segments uh, in particular city locations outside of new york city we would really love your ideas and help you can follow us um, on our LinkedIn group, uh, YaleFin, or feel free to email us at YaleFin at gmail.com. We'd also like to thank the Alumni Association for all of their encouragement and assistance. Henry, who's here tonight, Nicholas, Whaley Chang, Director of the YAA, and Nancy Stratford, Chair of the YAA Board, who is also with us here tonight. Uh, well, let's turn now to tonight's speaker. We could not think of a better inspiration uh, for our members and alumni than Professor Schiller. Professor Schiller has made fundamental contributions to the understanding of economics and its application to economic policy, all the while, in his own words, pursuing unusual directions in this research, in his popular writing, and in his practical inventions and policy recommendations. Much of Professor Schiller's economic research has focused on patterns in asset prices. His PhD dissertation introduced novel econometric methods to test for market efficiency, applying this analysis to the bond market. His research expanded the question whether markets were efficient um, over a 
over a uh, short time period, over a longer time period, and whether routine tests for market efficiency might in fact allow for fads or fashions in investment behavior. In 1981, Professor Schiller showed that the high volatility of U.S. stock market uh, returns actually conflicted with the prevailing conception of market efficiency, a key result that was cited in his award in 2013 of the Nobel Prize in Economics. Professor Schiller continued to study cases of widespread overvaluation by investors. He argued that bullion market expectations can create rapid increases or bubbles in financial asset prices, which he described in two books, Market Volatility and Irrational Exuberance. Professor Schiller is well known for forecasting the bursting of the dot-com stock bubble in 2000 and the crash in the real estate market that precipitated the financial crisis. Professor Schiller's broad-ranging intellectual curiosity has often led him down more eclectic paths than other academics. In the past, his peers have warned him against going down the wrong road. Uh, these courageous explorations, however, have made Professor Schiller a pioneer in the field of behavioral economics, applying psychology and sociology to interpret economic behavior. Many of these insights are detailed in his recent popular books with George Agarwal, Animal Spirits, and Fishing for Fools. Professor Schiller has demonstrated a tremendous knack for practical inventions of great value in the financial industry. Schiller's cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio is the most widely referenced valuation metric for U.S. stock prices. The Case Schiller Home Price Index is the leading member, uh, measurement of U.S. residential housing prices. He's advocated derivative products to help homeowners hedge against price swings and help federal taxpayers shield themselves from unexpected declines in national GDP. He typically couples his research on market inefficiencies with detailed policy prescriptions for mitigating them. But aside from these great contributions, uh, this crowd probably knows Professor Schiller best as a guide and mentor. A professor at Yale since 1982, for many of us, he was the first to trace out the fascinating history of financial markets, to frame financial innovation as an evolving technology with one productive new tool following another, like any science, and to inspire us with the potential for financial tools to improve the lives of ordinary workers and families. We know you, Professor Schiller, as a teacher, as an author, and as a contributor to our understanding of economics and policy. To do any of these so well individually is quite difficult. To be able to do all is very rare indeed. Please join me now in a warm round of applause to welcome <laughs> Professor Schiller. Exaggerate the 
perfection of this technology either. So that's not what I'm particularly uh, talking about here, uh, here today. Uh, now, I, I want to kind of link my talk into current events at least a little. And I, unfortunately, there was this event. <laughs> vibrant and alive, and it spreads by contagion. And so they, these are, uh, uh, to me, uh, why do economists not talk more about that? I, I documented in my presidential address that of all the social sciences in the university, finance is the least likely to talk about narratives. But it seems to me it's quite the opposite. Narratives drive financial markets. Sto crazy stories get started. <laughs> And they change everything. So uh, again, I, so I'm not writing a whole book now called Narrative Economics, and I can't really do justice to that here. But we'll just give a little bit of a uh, introduction. Uh, so uh, you you know this story very well. I don't have to tell you this story. <laughs> <laughs> but it, uh, I was I only had time to watch a little of it on TV today. Uh, but I, I got a sense of uh, disquiet. <laughs> there were too many angry people. It didn't feel good to me, but somehow it's riveting. I actually would have watched more if I had time. Maybe you have the same feeling. So I was thinking about this uh, story, and it reminded me of another story, which to me seems very similar. Um, remember this story? Yes. This is 1954. It's called the Army McCarthy hearing. That Senator Joe McCarthy uh, on, on the left uh, in a Senate hearing, and on his right is another Mr. Cohen, and his <laughs> who was his research assistant. Uh, and this really it was it was televised for days in 1954. Uh, anyone here watch it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed. That's great. Uh, but even those, still of you, alive. those of you who didn't watch it probably heard of it. So what was this all about? Well, it was Joe McCarthy who suddenly leaped into fame uh, for um, his claims that the um, U.S. Army and other branches of government were being taken over by communists. And not only that, even worse, homosexuals. <laughs> so. Uh, it, when he started the hearings, he had a high approval rate. They already had Gallup polls. His approval ratings were over 50%. Everybody was interested that the, that the communists are infiltrating everything. Uh, but as the, as the testimony continued, public opinion made a huge and sharp turn against him. Uh, and uh, uh, because they started to think, this man is crazy. It's, 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 not everybody, it's not like it's a mind control that communism is uh, capturing people's souls. Uh, and so he, he, he uh, now I'll come back to this. And I don't think it's possible to forecast financial markets based on one thing, but I'll show you what happened in the financial markets after these hearings. Now, let me just say, I should have maybe said this first. Uh, 
one of the things that's making uh, uh, narratives or stories more viral is the online revolution. And I just wanted to give my own little history of this. Uh, and uh, it's a Yale history, because I've been at Yale all this time. Uh, I first uh, joined Yale online courses in 2003, uh, when it was called All Learn. It was a uh, joint uh, product of Oxford, Stanford, Yale, and then other uh, universities. Uh, Diana Klein, who is a professor here of art history, was running the show. And I had an online course. Uh, uh, it was rather different then. Then uh, there was another, Diana, Diana Klein who started another, uh, op another online course called Open Yale. <coughs> that one you can still see. If you go to alllearn.org, it's blank today. Uh, they shut it down. But open, oyc.yale.edu is still up and running. So I did a 2008 uh, course, Mac Financial Markets. Then I did a 2011 course. Uh, and then they, uh, Joined with Coursera, which is a company that uh, uh, provides online courses for many from many universities. Uh, and then uh, that was in 2014, did another version. And then in 2017, another version. Uh, this now with the new, it's now called the Purvu uh, Center after a donor uh, for, from Yale. And I consider this event as sort of connected. And this is another networking. Uh, it has something to do with. Uh, advertising, at least, this talk on the web. Uh, so, but, but this is a sign of how the world is changing. It's getting more viral. There's more... Uh, I, I, it kind of scares me, actually, uh, that I've, I've reproduced myself so many times. I mean, I get in front of my class, I wonder, what am I doing? I mean, I'm already recording. I've turned myself into a robot. <laughs> So anyway, I wanted to talk about finance, though, here, which is, I think, not immune to this kind of uh, viral phenomenon. And I, I, I'm going to say things rather briefly, but I, I wanted to show you, I hope you can see this well. Uh, this is a plot of U.S. stock prices uh, from 1871 to the present. Uh, I actually got today at the very end. Uh, <laughs> I like the, you can see these updated on my website, right? But that's, uh, we're right there. Uh, the blue line, that's real inflation corrected stock prices. It's the S&P composite index. The, the green line is a little bit hard to see, but it's real earnings uh, per share for the same uh, S&P composite index. Uh, so uh, the, the first thing that might jump out at you is what in the world is going on here? This is now. That's 2009, the bottom of the financial crisis. It looks like we're in the biggest bull market ever. Uh, I'm not going to qualify that. But uh, earnings look choppy and seem to be correlated a bit with it. But earnings overall have been growing along kind of a steady trend for uh, almost 150 years. So what's all this movement? What determines all these movements? Uh, I, I did say that uh, I wanted to qualify my statement that uh, this is the biggest stock market boom ever by uh, saying percentage-wise it's not. And one way you can see that is a uh, plot with a log scale or a ratio scale. You see, on the, uh, uh, this is a little technical, but that's 10. That's 10 times 10. That's 10 times 10 times 10 and this is uh, even 10 times more. So it puts everything so that you can get a percentage change sense. So here we are. It's a pretty big boom we've had. But it's not the big, I say it's the fourth biggest. The biggest is 1929, no, 1921, that's there, to 1929. That's called the Roaring Twenties, all right? <laughs> By the way, it ended badly. <laughs> That's the biggest. And then, I don't know what second, so it's that, is that over the 60s, or this over the, uh, up to the year 2000. Uh, and then here we are. So th th there must be something driving this. And what is it? 
Uh, I can tell you through other analysis, it's not the usual culprits that you think of, like interest rates or GDP. These things are just mysterious movements uh, that uh, I think um, require some, uh, maybe some storytelling. And that's what I'm doing in my book. Uh, but, so what I call narrative economics is the study of, of stories people tell and understandings that people have of how the economy works, which informs their decision. Economists like to say that people uh, are rational and take account of all information as it comes in. That means they think like economists, but a lot of people don't. <laughs> and they, they, their actions depend, uh, make things happen. So I've been going through these periods, and it's not just on in terms of the stock market, but in terms of GDP and other markets. And uh, so I'm not, uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me go back, get ahead a little bit more and talk about uh, home prices. Uh, this is a plot. These are both plots from my book, uh, uh, Irrational Exuberance, which is now in its third edition. It came out in 2000. Uh, the, the blue line is home prices in the United States since 1890, in real terms, corrected for inflation. This is not New York City, by the way. This is the United States. Uh, and uh, again, What's going on right now? Uh, the log scale isn't so important here. This is just a regular scale. Because it, home prices really didn't trend up much. That's 1890. We go straight across. That's, 90, that's 2000 or 1990. It, it hadn't changed. This surprises me. When I came out with this, people are surprised. They said, aren't we running out of land? Aren't, isn't it getting scarce? Well, my data don't show that. Home prices didn't go up in real terms for 100 years. But then they have these strange swings. So this is the, uh, the bubble that preceded the, uh, the, the new millennium. Uh, so what's driving? Well, I'll tell you what's not driving them. It's not building costs. Because this is a uh, building cost and what it costs to build the house. Uh, it doesn't look anything like home prices. Maybe it did back then, back here in the good old days, before 1950. Uh, building costs were declining and home prices were declining. The economists back then kept saying, home prices will continue to fall because we're getting better and better at building homes. Uh, and uh, home prices should come down with the cost. Uh, they thought they had it all figured out, but home prices haven't behaved that way. Uh, and so. Uh, I, I just want to uh, say that I think that the cause of these big fluctuations is, is very human and very personal. It's some kinds of stories. And I was just going to give you some sense of, uh, of stories for each of these. But it, it's a complicated... My book is not a final word on this topic. I think it's a very difficult topic to research. What were the stories and understandings people had? Uh, we're getting better at it though with digitized texts. And I have now, and other people, many people are starting to do this. They, they do searches, semantic search, and other kinds of search for phrases and ideas. And you can search in newspapers, advertisements, magazines, sermons, diaries, uh, all kinds of things that give you indicate what people were saying and talking about. And you have to not just search them numerically, you have to go back and read them uh, to get a sense. Uh, uh, the power of a story depends on how it's told. And you don't, you're not in a mindset to understand the story, why it had emotional impact. But I can talk, I, I was just going to finish by giving you a few stories. So, uh, uh, what, what should we, there was this big fall in real home prices leading into 1920. Why did it fall? But it was partly because they weren't used to it. Like we had the new Federal Reserve, and it was printing money really fast. We had 100% inflation. And the people didn't adjust for that. So real home prices fell. Maybe that's a little anomalous. But uh, look at the next one here. Nin this is 1942 to 1947. A huge upswing in home prices. Why do you think that happened? I, I, I'm sorry, I'd like to ask you to answer. Uh, I'll tell you. 
Are you the end of the war, people come back. You got it. She said the end of the war. Uh, but it started before the end of the war. It started 1942 was the bottom of the market. And in 1943, it was starting to boom. OK, I'll just put a little more embellishment on your answer. People thought the end of the war was coming soon. <laughs> and they're going to be, these soldiers are coming back, and they're going to want to have families. And they haven't been building any houses. So let's speculate. Let's buy the houses now. And uh, so the whole thing took place during the war, annoying many people. What you don't see in those narratives is any sense that home prices always go up or that uh, housing is the best investment. It was topical. It was right now because of the war. So it's a totally different boom than we have now. Uh, and then I want to go to uh, this boom, which is the biggest ever. What caused that? Well, I, it's, it's, um, uh, it's a lot of things. But there are, I, I mentioned stories about flippers. Story, now the story was that home prices had always gone up. Uh, and uh, the, the expectation was that home prices would go up, according to one of my surveys I did in 2004, 12% a year. Hey, the mortgage rate is only 6% a year. This sounds like a no-brainer. Buy as many houses as you could. That was the narrative. Totally different from the 1942-47 narrative. Um, so, uh, now I don't have a really great explanation of the current. I, I invite your suggestions. What is happening now? Well, it's not as big. I, I think it has something to do with Donald J. Trump, uh, who is a sort of inspiration for a, a high living and real estate. He's a real estate president. Some, something is happening in our culture now that is encouraging. Uh, but I'm not sure that it's so steady or stable. Uh, so I'm not going to give you a really enlightening answer. Let me go back to the stock market. Uh, so you can see um, what was happening here. Uh, well, OK, we had a big drop in the stock market that bottomed out in 1921. Why? Why did that happen? Well, I think it was partly because of an American set sort of anger against companies who made a lot of profits during World War I. And that, that was called profiteering. It was a new word. And people, the, the emotional trauma of the war was transformed into this anger at business. So they put on a huge excess profits tax uh, on corporate profits above 1913 levels. And they didn't take it off until I think it was 22. So people were angry. And they were boycotting companies. who were They, they blamed the inflation on uh, evil companies that were pushing prices up. And so I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to postpone buying anything from these evil companies. But it kind of ended quickly. And that's another puzzle. I don't have everything completely understood. And then it brought us in, then they completely changed. The new narrative of the roaring 20s was about <coughs> stock market millionaires who made huge sums of money. Uh, there, there was a time of uh, acceptance of business schemes. Then what happened in 1929? There's this huge, this, uh, this thing, the stock market fell 85% in real terms in a matter of less than three years. How can that possibly happen? How can it drop so much? But you can see what was also happening. Sales of Ford cars fell 85% from 1929 to 1932. Now that's huge, huge drop. Why is that? Well, I think it was, uh, this is what I'm trying to research for my book. It had something to do with our, a number, it's a number of narratives that happened to coincide at that time. But notably among them was uh, a, a narrative that robots are taking over our jobs. <laughs> Believe it or not, they called them robots. That, there was a 1920 play by Carol Chapik called Rossum's Universal Robots, which coined the term. And they used it loosely through many automated equipment that they had in the, in the 1930s. So people thought they were about to lose their jobs, and they would never get them back. They were replaced by a robot. They tended to believe this because it seemed plausible at this time when unemployment was so high. But it was actually the belief that was causing it. 
Another thing that happened in the Great Depression was that there was a movement toward frugality. That, you know, you don't have to live like the keeping up with the Joneses. You don't have to be rich. America is built on humble people who are, there, there was some uh, idea. You actually felt ashamed to spend money uh, during the Great much part of, there was a tremendous sympathy for people who lost their jobs. There were narratives about someone had a family of four kids, he lost his job, he's not coming back, he's trying to sell his house, he's going to go bankrupt because he can't, uh, he can't uh, pay off the mortgage. Uh, and those stories were sob stories. So one thing about the Depression that you probably didn't know, some commentators during the Great Depression said, you know, I actually like it now because people are just nicer. They're not so show-off. This, this is a changing narrative. Um, so I just, I'm up, I think I'm almost out of time. Let me just go uh, talk about what I call the millennium. <coughs> this is a huge boom in stock prices. And what was it driven by? Uh, well, it's, it's related to this robot story, but it was the internet and networking that people thought would, uh, would maybe reduce their, it's, it's complicated. They, they, were, uh, they were not holding back on their spending until after 2000, and then we had a recession. But they, they believed that the internet was uh, changing, their, uh, changing their lives, and it took on great proportions. Uh, what we have now, the last thing, uh, I think, it, 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 again, it's the same perennial narrative that comes back with new forms. The newest form is an artificial intelligence or machine learning. And it's, an, it's uh, we, we, again, we keep thinking, each of these boom periods is a hypothesized new era that, that people think is now changes everything. Uh, but it, but it, 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 our new narrative is somehow mixed in with Donald Trump and others like him. Uh, and uh, I think that we're not, we're spending money freely now despite our fears about losing jobs because we, we have something that Elizabeth Warren uh, has argued about in her book. We feel that we, if we have to survive in the new unequal world. We have to live high to establish ourselves as part of the uh, elite class. We have to promote our children heavily. Uh, don't let them just run out and play. Have them study or do activities to get into an elite university. So this culture was not, it was not present in the Great Depression, not very strong. And it's now taking, so we are spending a lot, but we're also believing a lot in financial markets. But that's a little bit glib, but I, the, the conclusion that I want to leave with you is that I think that we will be there will be changes in economic and financial research in the not so distant future that will enable us to get a better picture. It won't be as simple as I've described because there's many different narratives competing at the same time. It's not easy to study these. Not many people are trying. Marketing people are trying for marketing purposes, but I think we have to try to study the changing narratives that envelop our lives with a purpose more uh, broad about understanding how e major economic events happen and how we might be vulnerable to them. So I'll stop and uh, I hope I, uh, oh, maybe I'll, if you have other in in interpretations of my narrative that I'd like to know about. <laughs> so we have a mic. We don't, uh, but uh, if you can speak loudly with uh, your question, then the professor will repeat it for the rest of the room. Like to take uh, a couple questions. All right. So, thank you. If you were wondering about why uh, real estate values are maybe high today, uh, if my memory serves me well, last time you were here, you were talking about your study about true and false information around the world, and that perhaps there's more false information today than there's ever been. One, some would argue that there, we're living in a world of mistrust in institutions and in governments and enter private enterprise. It, it, is there something there as to why people believe hard assets like home 
may sustain value more. And finally, you talked about emerging technologies. It's a complicated question. I hope it'll repeat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Do you think a transparency such as blockchain could play a role in quantum finance? Oh, okay. Now you're stimulating me to talk about blockchain. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I think it's it, it, it's it's common. Kind of, I don't have the ability in a short talk or even in a book to, to explain accurately all of these movements. But home price increases are 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 partly due to they'll say low interest rates. The, but, but overall, interest rates haven't explained home price movements that much. I think it's, it's, uh, it has, it's a multiple narrative story. That, now, you bring up blockchain. That, that, uh, that's a technology used by Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Uh, I, I talk about this in my book. Uh, I'm interested in it from a different standpoint. Well, I try to figure out the technology. Uh, there's a good book by Mariana on, uh, on understanding uh, blockchain, and, uh, but I, I still find it a very obscure uh, science. There's some smart people who've designed Bitcoin. Whether they're good people and doing something for humanity <laughs> is another question. They're smart. Uh, but I think that uh, the, the phenomenal success of, temporary success of Bitcoin was uh, if you know what I'm talking, it's an electronic form of money that was invented by Mr. Satoshi Nakamoto, supposedly. Uh, and uh, it's supposed to be the wave of the future. It, the value of the uh, uh, Bitcoin reached over $300 billion out of nothing uh, in a matter of a few years. Uh, why did it sweep the world like that? That's a different question than how does it work. And I think that to me, the, uh, the answer is there's some uh, mutation or improvement in an old narrative that uh, brought Bitcoin to be an exciting, contagious story that could go viral. Uh, I compare it in my book with the uh, bimetallism uh, fad that developed in the 18. But it started out in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, but it peaked in 1896. Remember this one? Does it ring a bell? It doesn't. Uh, actually, though, you do know about it indirectly. I got you, you said no. Use of silver. Use of silver. Yeah, it is. But what, uh, do you remember uh, a uh, story called The Wizard of Oz? <laughs> well, that was written in. 1896, exactly the peak year. That's a book by L. Frank Baum. And apparently, there's some controversy about this, the yellow brick road is gold standard. And uh, Dorothy wore silver slippers. And the, uh, the Wizard of Oz was President McKinley. And the lion was William Jennings Bryan. <laughs> You're doubtful. Uh, it, is, uh, it does look like that story was part, uh, the, the book that L. Frank Baum wrote was panned by critics. Uh, critics. It's a children's book, really, but they didn't like it. But it, it was a huge bestseller. I think it had something to do with the spirit of that time. So the bimetallism was another proposal to change the money stock, and it was described in the most uh, emotional terms. Uh, I can get into that. Like, there, you should read the Coins Financial School, 1894. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful book. It's all wrong in the economic theory. It has lots of pictures like a comic book. But let me just say, Bitcoin, I think, benefits from a, a narrative that started in the 1840s uh, by the philosopher Proudhon, who uh, said that uh, he was the founder of anarchism, and he just hated government. He thinks government ruins our lives by regulating us and kind of imprisoning us with regulations. That narrative of uh, anarchist narrative got tainted by the, the, the impression that many of its followers gave that anarchism will bring chaos. Uh, and so 
the beauty of Bitcoin was that it was described as allowing a sort of anarchism that works. That Bit Bitcoin is not a a attackable by the government, according to the narrative. And there are lots of smart people, uh, like described by Ayn Rand in her novels, that are smart and pinned down by repressive governments. And this is a way out. Uh, it's, a fu it's a wonderful future for the whole world. And we don't even need governments anymore. Uh, and, and some of these people are openly anarchists. They even use that word. Uh, so so if, if I don't think that Bitcoin is famous for the reasons that people think about it. Bitcoin has some impressive technology, but the other app, the other engineers who designed this technology, you never heard of them. They, nobody cares about. They don't have a good story. They love the story of Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, partly because nobody can find him. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's another perennial story called the mystery. Why would somebody invent Bitcoin and then walk away and not? Not a, be nowhere. And so, how can it be? Doesn't somebody know him? <laughs> Nobody know, the, the, the original Bitcoin founders got an email from Satoshi Nakamoto. And they did what he said, they created it. This is an amazing story. And then he, he stopped it, Satoshi stopped answering his emails. He's just gone. <laughs> Craig Wright was an ambassador who claimed he was Satoshi Nakamoto. That's been discredited. Uh, so, it's just such a wonderful story. That's why we have Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, yes? Professor Schiller, I'd like to ask my Passover question, which is, how, why is this recovery different from all other recoveries? <laughs> I'm involved in real estate markets, and I've never seen a real estate market this late into recovery where you don't have a supply problem. And I'm wondering whether that might be at least partially the cause for the run-up in housing prices over the last 10 years. So he's asking about housing prices and the supply issue. So there is a puzzle. How home prices uh, could have gone up? Uh, uh, where did it go? Yeah. It's gone up a lot. It's almost up to the peak that it did before the financial crisis. Wouldn't you think that if home prices are going up, builders would be rushing to build more houses? That's what happened. You might say that's what happened here. Uh, there was a lot of construction uh, late in this boom. So why is it? Now, I'm not uh, able to give a final answer on that. One thing, though, is that a lot of people who were in the construction industry left it for the financial crisis. And so there's now said to be a shortage of skilled labor. This seems right to me because my son and daughter-in-law uh, just hired a nurse to take care of their new baby. And he's a former construction worker. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right. Uh, the other thing is that uh, there is a supply, natural supply constraint uh, that people want their houses in the right place. And we have zoning laws that are restricting that. Uh, and uh, there's natural limits to Manhattan. Manhattan, for example, had a housing boom in the 1880s. Uh, I remember reading newspaper narratives about that. They, one of them said, do you know that practically nothing is built in New York anymore that's less than five stories high? <laughs> <laughs> because we're just running out of land in Manhattan. <laughs> Uh, so that was a narrative that must have been the talk of the country. Uh, everyone knew that Manhattan was going through the roof. But it wasn't applicable to other parts of the country, so it didn't sweep the country. Now we think uh, it happens everywhere. Uh, okay, I'm just picking the people I see up front. <laughs> um, um, if narratives are driving markets, do you have any thoughts regarding how narratives arise and coalesce? Well, he's asking me, how do narratives arise and coalesce? In my book, and in my presidential address, which you can find now on the web, I, I really rely on, there's many other traditions uh, related to epidemics, many other thought processes outside of economics. 
I was particularly influenced by medical school, uh, mathematical epidemiology, which they teach in medical schools. Economists, some economists read that, but it hasn't taken over widely. So uh, this is not a new literature. In 1927, Kermack and, uh, and McKendrick wrote a medical journal article uh, about a mathematical model of epidemics that described how things go viral. Uh, and they had a, a two-parameter model. They had a contagion rate and a recovery rate. Now, uh, typically, uh, the contagion rate is below the, uh, the recovery rate is higher than the contagion rate. And if that happens, no epidemic is possible. People get over it faster than they spread it. But if some little mutation or change in the environment raises the contagion rate above the recovery rate, uh, then it'll just explode. There's a lot of evidence that disease epidemics really work that way. So I think this is an insight that you get from medical schools that you don't find in much economic discussion. That suddenly everyone's talking about Bitcoin. Why is that? Uh, it's because somebody else was talking about it. And so, I mean, we all hear about it. And eventually you decide, I better learn something about this because everyone's talking about it. It's the same thing with, say, movies. Uh, people who manufacture motion picture producers uh, will tell you that it's a huge gamble. It's, it, you, you, to predict the success of a movie requires subtle, uh, diff, it involves subtle differences in contagion rates. It's a, do people talk about this movie? People, word of mouth is a heavy, heavy promoter of things like that. Uh, and you just don't know whether the rate of talk will be high enough. Uh, so, so epidemics keep coming up, both of physical diseases and, that come up to the medical school, but also uh, in economics. So I like to pursue that in parallel. Okay, so maybe uh, one I, last I, We're not getting big questions from back. Right. Maybe you pick. I feel guilty. I just picked. <laughs> you, sir, in the, in the corner. Yes. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I was, uh, about uh, narratives related to income taxes and how they've changed through the uh, decades. Have you studied any of that? Like, for example, what they were saying about the different brackets back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, what you see today, where there are people who make $50,000 that object vehemently to uh, taxation above 10 million, for example, which makes no sense to me. Um, and Sort of the attitudes of the general, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, well, that's a long and big story about attitudes toward. He was asking about it. You must have heard that attitudes toward income taxes that they developed over time. Uh, income tax came in in uh, 1913 as a way of avoiding particular inequities in. Uh, the taxes which were more concentrated on the tariffs and property at that time. So it was supposed to be an improvement, but yeah, it, uh, it led to a sense of injustice. There's also a wealth tax, uh, which is separate from an income tax, uh, and people's ideas of fairness depend on, uh, not sure exactly how, uh, so Elizabeth Warren, Warren uh, wants a wealth tax. But I think that sounds like, to most people, like theft, whereas an income tax is different, because with a wealth tax, you're taxing income of the past, and now you're springing it on people afterwards. Uh, so there's issues of fairness, how these things are framed. You know, our attitudes toward income tax have changed a lot. But during World War II, the income tax rate reached 94% on the highest tax bracket. Uh, there's, a, um, there's a wonderful book by She and the Savage, a couple of political scientists, who analyzed how tax rates actually change. What drives tax rates? And they make the, the interesting conclusion is that when inequality gets worse, do you think tax rates on the rich would go up? Well, they studied 20 countries over, over a century. And they said the flat, no, that's not history. If inequality gets worse, they will not raise the taxes on the rich. So how did we ever get taxes on the rich? 
we got it through wars. It always happens during wartime because some young men are giving their lives. How can you complain about having to give 94, but then you live, right? <laughs> We're not putting you on that. So some rich person who's profiting from the war, uh, hey, 94% sounds right to most people in that circumstance. <laughs> well, please join me in thanking Professor Schoen.